we have you registered as John Lott, representing the Crime Prevention Research Center, testifying against the bill. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Please continue. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, my name is John Lott. I'm president of the Crime Prevention Research Center. I've been a senior advisor for research and statistics at the U.S. Department of Justice and held many other positions. Everybody wants to try to figure out a way to try to stop these attacks. But I want to try to do something that's going to actually work. What you find, and I've read I don't know how many diaries and manifestos from these mass murders, is that they want to get media attention. And they know the more people they kill, the more media attention that they're going to get. And so time after time after time, they explicitly write statements saying that they're trying to pick places where they know victims can't go and defend themselves. You take the Nashville school shooting that just occurred. One of the things that the Nashville police chief noted after reading the manifesto from that killer was that the killer actually had another target that they were going after. It was only when they found out that there was armed security there that they moved on to another target. You look at the Louisville bank attack. Again, it occurred in a gun-free zone where the killer, obviously being an employee, knew that when he attacked before bank hours, he was going to be able to attack there without having to worry about people being able to go and stop him. You see this, the Buffalo mass murderer last year. In his manifesto, it gets no national news attention. The media refuses to go and report these parts of these manifestos, explicitly spends a great deal of time, like many of these guys do, explaining why he picked the target that he did. And his number one reason, he wanted to go to a place where he didn't believe victims would be able to go and defend themselves with permanent concealed handguns. So these guys may be crazy in some sense, but they're not stupid. They explicitly pick targets where they know victims can't defend themselves. Six months is a short amount of time for these individuals to go and plan these attacks. Many of these attackers, such as the Sandy Hook killer, spent over two and a half years planning the attack. These guys are very difficult to go and stop from going yet. And just talking about one thing that I think is extremely important here, and that's armed teachers. We've looked at all school shootings in the United States from 2000 on, everything from an accidental discharge all the way up to a mass public shooting. And there has not been one single attack where anybody's been wounded or killed in any school that has armed teachers. There's thousands of schools in the United States with armed teachers. 20 states have armed teachers, okay? And it varies, and I'm happy to go through that in much more detail. Members, any questions? I do. Yes, sir. Representative DeRazio. Mr. Lott, I appreciate you coming by and taking the time out of your busy schedule to testify. I'm in construction, and whenever we have a situation that we have to solve, we, we look at what's going to be the best way to solve the problem. Uh, um, what can we do that will work to stop public shootings? And, and this particular bill, why don't you think it will work? Sure. Thank you. I appreciate that. I think we need to take these mass murders at their word at least take it seriously. Because uh, if you go to our website at crimeresearch.org, we have statements from many manifestos and diaries from these killers where they explicitly explain why they picked the targets that they did. I don't understand why the news media doesn't find it newsworthy to go and quote from these parts of their discussions. Even in the Nashville one, you will not find any discussion in the New York Times, the Washington Post, or anything else, even though you'll find the Nashville police chief reading from the manifesto and explaining to people why this person packed up, passed up another target. Their goal is to get media coverage. I'm not arguing you get rid of the First Amendment. What I'm arguing is that you need to take that seriously and think of how you reduce their goal. And the way you do that is by making it so they can't kill as many people. And having somebody there quickly with a gun or convincing them that somebody is there with a gun, rather than having a sign in front of a school that says this school is a gun-free zone, have a sign in front of the school that says warning, select teachers and staff at this school, have guns and will use them. And you can't just have a uniformed school resource officer there. Here's the problem. How many of you would have an air marshal in uniform? Why wouldn't you put an air marshal in uniform? Because you know if you put an air marshal in uniform there, he would be the first person that the terrorists on the plane, if there were terrorists, would try to take out. 
when you have a, a, a person in uniform and he's the only person with a gun, you give huge tactical advantages for the people that are doing the attacks. They can either wait for the person in uniform to leave the area before they attack, or they can move on and pick some other target, or having that person, it's like a neon sign above them that says, shoot me first. Because once the killers take that person out, they have essentially free reign to go after other people that are there. You look at the types of discussions we've been having here this evening. People have been talking about banning certain types of guns. You know, AR-15s have been talked about a lot. AR-15s are functionally identical to small caliber hunting rifles, firing the same bullets with the same rapidity, doing the same damage. We heard the sponsor here talk about his beliefs about the rates that these types of weapons are used in these attacks. If you look over the last 25 years, 14% of mass public shootings in the United States involve any type of rifle only. Over the last 10 years, 18% do. The vast majority of these things, over half, involve only handguns. And so the notion that you can go and stop people simply by eliminating one type of semi-automatic gun when there are multiple types out there simply doesn't make any sense. But the other thing you have to take into account is that people use these guns defensively. So if you ban guns, let's say rifles, in this bill that go and take, uh, take uh, magazines, you essentially mean the only type of gun people are going to be able to have is a manually loaded gun, where you have to physically yourself chamber another bullet to be able to go and fire it. That takes time. If you are using a gun defensively and you have to fire multiple shots because you're facing multiple criminals or you fire and miss or you fire and wound but don't incapacitate the attacker, you may not have the luxury of time. There's research out there by Thomas Marvel in the Journal of Law and Economics that indicates that when age limits have increased, you actually see higher crime rates against those who are under the age limit there. You see increases in murders, committed against those individuals, and you see increased rape rates. So you just can't focus only on one thing here. You have to look at the total lives that are going to be lost or cost here. There's no serious cost-benefit analysis that's occurring here. We see something bad, and we want to go and change it, but we don't realize that there could be other bad things that could result from this. But if you're going to have one thing to do to stop this, you've got to get rid of gun-free zones. It's not just the statements from these people. 94% of the mass public shootings in the United States take place in areas where guns are banned. These guys want to get news coverage, and they're going to get it by killing more people. I, I'll give you one last story just so you have an idea about this. You guys, look at the Sandy Hook killer. According to police, he had put together essentially a doctoral dissertation where he had looked at mass public shootings around the world over 40 years. He had graphed out the relationship between the number of people killed and the amount of news media coverage that he got. His goal, according to one police report, was to kill more people than the Norway killer who had shot to death 67 people, which is much worse than any mass public shooting in the United States, because he wanted to get more worldwide news attention than that person had got. By having a sign and convincing them that somebody's there to stop them, will. You see them say, if I can only kill more people than such and such did, I can get more media attention. You need somebody there quickly with a gun to stop them. Mr. Johnson. Uh, Mr. Lott. Mr. Lott. Okay, um, Go ahead. Mr. Lott, I have a couple more questions for you. From the committee here and, and from what some of the people said out there, the age 18, 19, and 20-year-olds keeps coming up. And 18... 19 and 20 year olds commit homicides at relatively high rates. Right. And isn't that a good reason to ban people at those ages from possible guns? No, no, I understand the argument. But the problem you have to take is what you're stopping is people who are going through background checks now from getting the guns. You're stopping people who are legally buying a gun. And so you can't just look at all 18, 19, and 20 year olds because it's exactly right. As a group, 18, 19, and 20-year-olds commit homicides at relatively high rates. But what you're stopping is a subset of those who can pass background checks. And those people tend to be very law-abiding. We have data on concealed carry permits and revocation rates for 18, 19, 20, including 21 and 22-year-olds. 
And we have it for Texas, uh, and we have it for Michigan, and we have it for Nevada. And what you find is that, in f first of all, permit holders as a whole are extremely law-abiding. Uh, they lose their permits for any firearms-related crime at one-twelfth the rate that police officers do. But those who are actually under 21 actually are slightly less likely even than the average permit holder to go and lose it. And so that's the comparison. Because you're just not, these other 18, 19 year olds, 90% of murderers have a violent criminal history and are already illegal for them to own a gun. So they're not the ones you're stopping by going and, and having this law that you're passing. The law you're passing are stopping the ones who can currently pass a background check, and those are much more law-abiding than these other individuals that are there. Okay, also this evening, some several people brought out about that uh, Supreme Court Bruin decision, and, and it said something about implying for raising the age to own guns to 21. What was that about? Right. <clears throat> Well, I mean, as has been pointed out, there's been a diversity in the courts in terms of uh, the rulings on this. But uh, the 11th Circuit, they essentially relied on some work done by Duke Law School. And it turns out that they misinterpreted their, their readings of some of the laws. So here's what the Bruin decision said. The Bruin decision said, you first look at the Second Amendment. If that's not clear, you go and look at the legislative debate that occurred. If that's not clear, Clear, then you look to see what laws were in effect in either 1791 when the Second Amendment was adopted or uh, in 1868 when the 14th Amendment, which applied the Second Amendment to the states, was ratified. In the 1790s, all the colonies had rules mandated, mandating that people had to own guns. You had Connecticut, for example, uh, males between 16 and 42 were mandated to own a rifle. In Connecticut, it was males 17 to 42. In Pennsylvania, it was 17 to 42. In fact, many states had those laws for over 100 years. By 1897, Connecticut still had a law in the books that mandated that people between the ages of 18 and 42 were required to own a rifle. There's no state during any of those years, any of those periods of times that comes close to actually saying they couldn't own a gun at those ages, all the ones were the opposite. And so if you follow what the Bruin decision says, I think it's going to be very difficult to go when it finally gets to the Supreme Court and some of the evidence that the 11th Circuit was based on uh, is going to be able to hold up. But look, I don't usually argue these things on, uh, on rights types things. To me, the issue is what makes people safer. And you have an unbelievably horrible thing that happens here, but you also have horrible things that are avoided by people being able to go and use guns defensively. And if you look at something like the Marvel book, uh, Marvel uh, journal paper, I think you'll find that these laws unintentionally, despite the best intentions, actually can result in more deaths. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lott. I appreciate your time and your testimony. Thank, Thank you, you, Johnson. Mr. Ross, um, Lott. what? I'm sorry? Lot. Oh, Mr. Lott. Where did I get Ross from? I have no idea. Okay, I, I'm sorry. Anyway, what country has the most guns, possesses the most guns? Possesses the most guns? Yes. Say either per capita? I'd say either. I didn't say per capita. Most guns. How many guns are in the United States of America? Well, we don't know exactly. It's you, like, are, you are crime prevention research. Right. But so research would tell you simply on a Google per, research that there are 393 hundred, million guns in the, but, in the United States of America. Sir, okay, I'm try, was trying to answer your question. We don't know exactly. We have guesses, and the reason why we don't know is we have to make estimates about the rates that guns depreciate in order to try to figure that out, because unlike other countries where you have to have it registered, but... You know why we have to guess? To because we, you people like you don't want us to know. So at the end of the day... I don't know what you people mean. At the end of the day, look. people who advocate against having regulations on guns. Okay. So again, my question is, on a if, country, if basis, America has a simple Google research can come up with 393 million guns in the United States. 
who leads the world in gun deaths? Not per capita, but simply we're, by We're below guns. the average in the world in, in gun deaths per capita, and we're also- I'm gonna ask you per capita. Look, are you gonna compare the number of deaths in Wyoming versus Texas, the total? No, you're gonna go and look at the per capita I'm rates. Not. No, I'm not. Yes, I, well, every news tell me report is going to do that. Nobody's going to just go and not adjust for the population. We have 300, over 330 million people in the United States. But if you look at a per capita rate, Switzerland and Israel have higher per capita gun owners possession rates than we have here in the United States. India has a billion people. How many people die of guns over there? Well, I don't know off the top of my head for one country. But I'm telling you, if you look across all countries, Mr. the United Ross, States what? is below the mean and we're below the median in term, more than half the countries in the world have higher homicide rates than we have here in the United States. Mr. John Lott, you, you were saying that gun-free zones don't work. You were saying more They're guns. They're a magnet for attacks. You are saying more guns work to protect. <coughs> There were 77 police officers standing outside of Robb Elementary, and yet none of those guns stopped the one gunman who had a gun that killed all those children. So what is your answer to 77, was it 77 officers? 176, 376 officers. Right, so here's the difference. So none of them stopped that one gunman. Right, so here's the difference. It's a, it's a lot different for somebody to run into gunfire than it is if I'm a teacher and somebody's coming at me. But the big thing is there has never been an attack, an attack where anybody's been wounded or killed at any school that has an armed teacher. The thing is you can avoid these attacks from even occurring to begin with by putting up a sign that warns these attackers that somebody will be there in order to stop them. You know, even if, even if it's just something they fear that's there. You see the Nashville shooter. Okay. Why did the Nashville shooter not pick their first target? My question was in respect to your testimony is that more guns protect. I'm simply asking you, why didn't 300 officers stop one gunman <coughs> based on what you're saying? And I'm just trying to figure it out. And when you're giving these statistics and these facts, I just want to make sure okay, that well, you're I'll giving explain. statistics it's, and If facts. I'm a teacher there, no, 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 no. it's somebody's running no, no. into the Sir, building. what I'm asking for is I, facts, and not I, opinions. Well, you're just, you're, look. I'm asking facts. You're asking for an explanation. I'm no, trying no. to provide you an explanation. You're saying at the end of the day facts I'm asking right officers have guns versus one individual with a gun you're asking for an explanation they did sir. not go I'll in. give you an explanation you want the explanation here's no, the I explanation don't. no I don't I know you I'm, don't. I'm, I'm fine but thank you no, I, at the end of the day no, my my, you, my no, question the point was, is if you have somebody sir, there the sir. teacher can't represent Bob. the teacher has a gun excuse me sir I've been recognized um I want your explanation. So, Vice Chair Johnson asked you, so go ahead and finish your explanation. A teacher does what? If I'm in the room there and somebody's coming in, I can try to hide behind the desk, but that's not going to save me. The teacher has no option other than to try to defend themselves. Are you going to give them the tool? Are you going to give them the chance that they're going to be able to do it? A police officer, we're all human, okay? What is police that? officers Mr. outside. Mr. I understand Lott. we're paying them to go and do it such as the Nashville police did when they ran in right afterwards and has happened at other places. Though even in Nashville, it took them 14 minutes to show up on the scene, even though they ran in as soon as they got there. But it's much harder. People are human, and whether it's Parkland or whether it's Uvalde, people have fear of running in there. But if I have no place to run, Sir. somebody's coming in at me. <coughs> Sir, I... I um... Again, with all due respect, I have been a teacher of record in a classroom with a gun on the other side of the door with children in the classroom. And you're exactly right. As the teacher, you're going to defend those children before you defend yourself. Just like they say on the airplane, put the mask on your child before you put it on yourself. So the teacher is going... 
put it on yourself yeah. before you put it on your child. Yeah. But, sir, you are going to defend those children. Right. They're going to defend themselves, too. Their, life, well, their own well, life is... They, they are frightened. They are frightened. I know, but look. <clears throat> Let me... The chair advises our guests that the rules of the House strictly prohibit demonstrations or outbursts from visitors in the audience. Uh, I have a comment. Okay, but yeah. were you done uh, first? I, I, I really don't know because... You you didn't finish your explanation, but your explanation sounds like it has a lot of holes in it. It really does. Okay. You can. Go ahead. Yeah. It was a good one. Thank you. Um, I really don't have a question. I have a comment because I think we've given you all the airtime we need to. Um, I have been reading that your claims have been refuted that you've committed a host of ethical violations, your research is riddled with numerous flaws and inaccuracies, that you fabricated an entire survey on defensive gun use. So I, I think that you've had the time that you need for tonight. Thank you. Representative Trucks. Right. Yeah. Uh, Representative Durazio. You, you need to give him a right to defend himself against a comment like that. Uh, do you have a question? No. Go ahead. Go ahead. Representative Trucks. I, I just would encourage all of us to treat each other with respect. He, I, um, as we all have, as we all have done up into this hearing so far, uh, Mr. Lott is one of the foremost experts in the country in preventing gun violence. We are all on the same page of trying to ensure that this never happens again and he is bringing you well-documented evidence, studies, and debunked. reports. Excuse me. But I have the floor. I have the floor. He, has, he is bringing you evidence, documents, and a lifetime of information and research on how to make sure that another child does not die of gun violence, and he is being treated with absolute disrespect. And we all, we, if we are going to save kids, we have to be able to have these conversations and we have to be able to listen to people who are offering information, well-researched information on how to do this. And I, I encourage the committee to take a moment to listen to what he has to say because he is offering you a solution to this problem that may or may not work in tangent with the specific bill, but there is not just one answer to this problem. This is a, a, this is a nationwide epidemic that has many different causes and many different solutions. We are focused on this one bill right here today, and we have to heard testimony focused specifically on raising the age. But I, for one, as a mother of three young children who absolutely, um, with, with a family who is from Uvalde and still lives in Uvalde, I want to make sure that not another child is ever murdered. And he is bringing us another solution to make sure that that happens. And I have to insist that he is treated with respect and dignity in this committee. That's your Johnson. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Vicki, you were saying something? Okay. At the end of the day, um, I think everybody has opinions and thoughts and with all due respect to whoever people think that is being disrespected families are here and we're asked to be heard and asked for action not false narratives not made up research but acts to do something to make sure that their children and your children and other families, and they were brave enough not to sit at home and do nothing but to come here to let us know what is taking place and what they think we can do. Because somebody feels guilty or someone feels uncomfortable with a line of questioning that we're offering a witness, that's on you, not on me. I'm gonna ask the tough questions of any individual 
who has the audacity to come here and say that the families that lost their children, I hear you, but that in itself is the most disrespectful thing that anyone could do to any individual. No, I want to make right. sure it doesn't right. happen oh. again. Hold on. But I think we need to move on, members. Um, I don't respond to what she was saying before. We gave you uh, right. enough time, and I think you, you laid out all your, your comments and your facts. And, I'm happy to and, go and provide and, any and detailed so, backup evidence for, like, the charts that I gave to go and show the rates. Uh, absolutely. And, and if you provide, you can provide uh, your, any charts or anything you've got to the committee, and we'll make sure that it's disseminated uh, to the entire committee. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes. He was called a fraud. And, and and some other allegations were were laid against him and he doesn't and and you know it, it'd be really nice to let him defend himself against those allegations uh, 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 hold on we we, we um, he he got his two minutes like uh, everybody else did and uh, members have questions and we respect everybody's ability to ask the questions I think it's 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 now gone to a, a, an area and a and a point that, to where we've got to put a stop to it. We've got, and by the way, we have 49 uh, remaining uh, folks still waiting to testify on this bill. We've got uh, five more bills, I think, four or five more bills to uh, to discuss before the end of the night, and um, uh, uh, we're going to move on. Thank you, sir. Thank you.